You all right? Yep, I, my mic fell out of my pocket. Right. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm um, the unorganized one of this duo. <laughs> it's all right. I'll help you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I want to pray. Um, this is going to sound really weird, but when I think about this gathering, have you guys ever played Mario Kart? You know, the, the, the driving game and stuff. Um, and I, if you've ever played it, you know, I, I, you know we have a bunch of kids. So, um, you know, you get behind and you get these little box gifts. And every once in a while, you get the one that's the bullet. Yeah, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, the bullet. And, and you push the bullet. It doesn't matter if you're in last place. It just makes you zoom. Sometimes you go from very last to first. So sometimes I just like, I'm just going to kick back and hope for a bullet. And, and, and every once in a while, I'll see one of my kids, like when they're learning and they got the bullet on the square, I'm like, push the bullet. Push, you know, and they don't. They don't, they don't you know, and it's like, you know, I'll reach over and push. I go, see, look, you're in first place. It, it just... Uh, for some reason that I'm not saying it's prophetic, it's Scott, but that thought keeps coming to my mind is, you know, not to reduce the Holy Spirit in any way, but I, I just feel like sometimes we don't know the amount of power that's available to us, that's right there at our fingertips, that can change everything. And so we keep like our, our hands on the wheel, like we're going to fix it. We're going to, I'm going to push, 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 push. Yeah, I'm going to, but when you read the scriptures, they're supposed to be like this power. Okay. Otherwise I could just give marriage talks and, and little helpful hints on how to have a happy marriage anywhere. But we're in a church right now and we have almighty God on his throne that this book is filled with times when, when someone just changes completely. There's like a power. And so the last thing I want to do is come here and just give you a few thoughts on marriage, help you communicate better, and, and you know, have your kids like you or whatever. I mean, those things are great, you know. But they can be done anywhere. And I know there are people in here with deep, deep connections with God. And when we unite in something, we gather together before his throne and say, God, would you please pour your grace out on this place? Would you just do it? Where it's invisible, where it's in a way, you, you won't even be able to point to, well, it's when he, the speaker said this, or when she said this, or when I... No, it just like falls upon you and you leave here and you're going, I, I don't even remember what, I, I remember one time I was, I was counseling a good friend of mine that was going to leave his wife and, and I remember just saying, I go, God, can you just do a miracle right now? Because I have one last talk with him. Can you just do a miracle right now? where I know it's you, and it's not me, and it's just, boom, would you just hit him? And we're talking, we're in my living room, and I'm talking to him. And he just gets up, and he goes, I gotta go. I'm like, what? He goes, everything makes sense now. He goes, I, I'm gonna go back I'm going to get things right. I go, well, what, what did I, what, what was it? He goes, I don't know a thing you just said. Mm -hmm. He seriously said, he goes, I seriously cannot tell you anything you said, but, and now they've been married 25 years, you know, raised kids, everything, you know, dear, dear, but, you know, some of our best friends. But I remember that moment where, oh my God, I asked for that. I remember when he left, I was just like, God, you heard me. Like, 
He didn't remember what I said, but the Spirit, something happened. And I want to pray that over us. That, that, that just throughout this weekend, at some point, God just pours his grace out. I want it tonight. So those who are strong in prayer, I know some of you are. Let's, let's come before the throne together. I mean, it all depends. Like, like this whole conference, everything depends on one person. There's one being, he's sitting on his throne right now, and he's looking down, and he just decides. You get that? And he just makes a decision like, I'm just going to pour my grace out on you. He just decides to do that. And everything's different. And so I'm not up here working so hard like, ooh, did I say that right? Did I say it's not about that. And you're not going home going, oh, did we get everything we needed to get out of tonight? And did you answer that question right? You know, let's go back. It's just so much pressure. And Jesus says, my yoke is easy. He has come to me. You who are weary, you're just exhausted. You just don't have this peace. Come. Let me take on my yoke. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. That's our God of grace. And so let's come before him right now. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, King of kings and Lord of lords. Praise you, Almighty God, sitting on your throne, giving us life right now, keeping everyone in this room alive, allowing all of our brains to work well enough to understand the words of this prayer. Everything's in your hands. And you're a God of grace. I am so grateful that you're a God of grace. Mm -hmm. Where would we be if you were not a God of grace and mercy? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Mm -hmm. I pray that you would pour your grace out every person here, everyone who's watching on a screen. It's all up to you. This is all a waste of time unless you decide to open our eyes, Lord. Show us the lies we've believed. Show us the power that's available to us. Show us the amount of love we could have. Oh, God. Please, Holy Spirit. Please come and fill this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Well, I'm going to have Lisa kind of maybe share where we're at in life, introduce the family. Where we're at in life. Um, we, we've <laughs> you know, just kind of give a state of the... Union? We are, <laughs> we are a union of nine. We have seven children, um, but we have grown. We have two married daughters, and three granddaughters. Oh, yes, there they are. Um, Rachel and Justin and their two bigger girls, five and almost three, and then Mercy and Peter and their little baby Anna. She's six months now. And right next to me is our daughter, Dalal, who came to us through adoption. And Zeke and Ellie are on the end. They're our 17 and 18 year olds, um, they are actually both out of the country right now with YWAM. 
um, South Africa and Bahrain. I don't know how to say that exactly. Um, and then we have two left at home, Claire and Silas, our 11 and 8-year-old. So, And Zeke, my son on the right, he's not that, I'm taller than him. <laughs> I don't know what happened on this picture. I mean, I'd love for him to be that tall. I'm like, you look like a foot taller than me. And he's actually an inch shorter than me. <laughs> so it's like a miraculous picture for him. Are you a little bit mad? No, no. I, <laughs> I just don't understand it. I don't know what he does. No, because he looks taller than my son-in-law. And my son-in-law is like half a foot taller than him. It's, yeah. it's weird. Okay. Anyway, yes. I think he photoshopped it. <laughs> he wore wedge shoes. What do you want to... Okay, here's a question for you. Um, what's your hope? This, this is good. Okay, and I want you guys to think about this too. Um, a friend of mine was just telling me, he goes, yeah, dinner the other night. We had this lady over with her kid, and, and she, before we prayed, she goes, okay, before you pray, I want to pray for you, and I want, you to, I want to ask you, what is your greatest hope in life right now? What are you most hoping for? Because I want to pray for that. I thought, wow, I haven't thought about that. What, what, if, I, if I had to narrow down, what do I want most? And so I even think about for today and tomorrow, what, what, what would you say would be your greatest hope? Why do you have to make me cry right from the start? <laughs> You guys get used to it. I cry a lot, and I can't help it, okay? I've tried. Um, I think it's when you get older. I remember my grandma crying all the time, and I'm like, why does she always cry even when she's baking a cake? She's like, honey, I forgot an egg, but Jesus made my cake taste so good. Like, she was just this, <laughs> she was so, so aware of the love of Christ, and that's a whole other story. But um, I think right now, currently, my greatest hope is that Jesus would come back and make all things new and right. Um, I happen to be in a little bit of a, like, sometimes you just carry the weight of where the world is at. And it's hard. Sometimes the darkness feels so dark. But even like walking into Jimmy and Laura's house tonight after flying here and driving for a couple hours, and you know, Jimmy's just all excited and they're happy and talking about, you know, just how awesome God is, which he is. But it's like my spirit needed that just to be reminded, like, don't ever lose hope, you know? Um, and I just really do want the Lord to like receive his reward. Um, we had a couple in our church that actually lost their six month old baby about six months ago. And it was just a huge tragedy for our whole church family to walk with them through this. But even just this last Sunday, we had a memorial service at her, what would have been her one year birthday. And to like witness them worshiping the Lord and clinging to like the promises of God. I just kept thanking the Lord throughout the whole morning. Like, God, thank you for showing me how shallow I am. Like that's deep. You know, when someone is suffering and in such deep pain, but their heart is just crying out to the Lord and holding on to his goodness. And it, it was like, and I'm thinking, Lord, thank you for stirring my affections for you. Like they are spurring me on to love and good deeds, just like your scripture teaches. And I so want that. Like I'm, when it first happened and we actually had a service at their home and Francis, I'd never heard him do this before, but as he was praying, he was like, Lord, receive the reward that you are due. Like this is an offering to you that this couple would praise you and say, preach the gospel to us. Give us the good news. We just want you to, we want 
to hear it out of your mouths. We want it to just wash over us. That was their number one desire when all of us came to their house a couple days later. And then for Francis to kind of set that perspective, like this is like a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Like we don't talk like that anymore. But you think about all of these passages that you've read, like this, we, we are now living sacrifices, right? Holy and pleasing to the Lord. And I just picture this aroma going up and the Lord is like, you know, I didn't want this pain to be on the earth, but I receive the praise of my saints who know that I am still good and that my sovereignty is over all and I will make things new. And I am coming back to make everything perfect. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more struggle, no more hardship. And yeah, I just was, that's what I want. <laughs> yes. Wow. All right. <laughs> She has no, she was, uh, when I met her, she oh was. Oh my goodness. Stop she was it. Miss Teen California. <laughs> I was just thinking about that one because they usually ask you, if, you know, what is your hope for the world? So I just felt that. Right. <laughs> Anyways. Um, I definitely would not have given that answer. Back then. <laughs> I was 17 years old. It was very what, shallow. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I don't know why I brought that up. Um, he literally brings it up all the time. <laughs> I just think it's funny that you were in pageants. Like, honey, it's I mean, been uh, over 30 years. You need to let it go. <laughs> <laughs> still proud of you, honey. <laughs> if they had, like, a Miss Grandma California, <laughs> she would dominate. Dominate. Thank you, okay. dear. Thank you for that. Um... But you know what, what Lisa was saying about our friends. I mean, it was, it, it is, uh, it's just one of those moments where you go, oh, "I'm so grateful to be surrounded by godly people like this." I mean, when we first went to their house, I mean, this was just shortly after the, you know, their 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 child died. This is our biggest fear, right? Let's just let's just be real. Right? Any of us that are parents, this is our this is what I hate about living on the earth. You know, like Lisa said, we have got a son in Africa, another one in the Middle East, you know, daughter in the Middle East. I, you know, she was sick for like two weeks straight. We can't get to her. We don't know what's going on. It's it's those types of things. And you you, you know, and then and then it then it happens to some of your closest friends and 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 you go to the house and you know immediately they just come up and they just embrace and they just sob. You know, and all the elders and wives were there and we all just we just wept. We just wept together. We don't know what to say. We just all got in a circle, like 15 of us, and we're just crying together. It's probably 20 minutes of just crying together until, you know, the mom just goes, okay, please, just, just someone preach the gospel to us. Preach the gospel. We need to hear good news. Just, just start saying verses. Just, you know, and it was just so powerful. And I, I just kept thinking about how, wow, you two are defeating the enemy right now. Do you know how angry the enemy is right now and how honored God is? And it's just beautiful. Like that's what we want to do as a family. That's what we want to do as a couple. I mean, when I think about uh, my hope, You know, there's always expectations wherever you go. And so if you go to marriage conference and people come with expectations and, 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 and yet as a, a pastor, as a preacher, I kind of have to not care, you know? <laughs> I'll make you explain that right. Like, like I, <laughs> yeah, as a pastor, you just have to not care about people, you know? Uh, no, you have to you have to get this point where you're like, God, 
I know some people are coming with certain expectations, but I got to say what I got to say. You know, like you, you just go, Lord, I'm, I'm not put on this earth to meet everyone's expectations. I want to meet yours. I want to say what you, and, and really, when I pray, like I'm on my knees over there going, God, what? What is the most loving thing I could say to you? It's, it's like your kids. They want something specific, but you have to think, is that the most loving thing for them? Is that what's best? Is that that's what's most needed? And as, as I'm on my knees over, I'm like, God, just, just make me love these people. I like, care about you as individuals. Like, really care. Not come up here and do my thing. Okay? But, but to care about every single soul that's here. Man, and, and as I do that, honestly, I, it's not my goal. It's not my hope that you just have a happy marriage. Okay? This is, this, we didn't even, and it's not like a bait and switch. We didn't say, hey, how to have a happy marriage. You know, that's the name of this. No, it's marriage in light of eternity. Okay, and that's what we call our book, You and Me Forever, Marriage in Light of Eternity. Okay, understanding like this life is over any second. There's no guarantee that everyone that's here on a Friday evening, everyone that's watching this on their screen on the Friday evening, that you're going to make it to tomorrow night. There's no guarantee of that. And so when I think, okay, what's the most loving thing I can do is, is help you think with an eternal lens, like, like to, to prepare you for the most important second of your existence. That one second when suddenly this is just over. It's just over. And I find myself before this almighty being. Like that second, what is that going to be like? And, and, and so my heart just always goes back to that. And besides, the thing is, is, is so many marriage issues are not really marriage issues. It's really, that's not at the root of it. At the root of it is, do I really know him? Am I so at peace with him? Do I get so much pleasure from knowing this God that I'm going to face one day that I'm just overflowing? Like Psalm 23 says, like my cup runneth over where he says, the Lord's my shepherd, and so I don't have these wants. In fact, my cup is overflowing. It's, you know, picture a cup here, and I'm just, you know, like, like if this is my life, this, this little cap, you know, it's just like, it's just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. It's, it's just going, it's, it's overflowing, and I'm so full that I'm not looking to my wife and going, oh, I feel so empty, I'm so needy. It's, it's just, it's, I'm just like, Oh man, I'm spilling over. Let me splash some onto you because I've gotten so much pleasure from this God and knowing him that I'm just overflowing. I, I once uh, did this illustration at, at the church where I brought a scuba tank, you know, on stage. And, and I said, you know, what I feel like some of your marriages are like, it's like there's just one tank and, uh, and, you know, and, and so she's trying to grab some, I'm grabbing it back from her, you know, back and forth, rather than both of us, we've got a full tank, and we just swim around together. But when we're needy, um, it's not because your wife isn't meeting your needs, or because I'm not meeting her needs. It's you're looking for the wrong place. You're looking to the wrong place to be like filled up. And Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. And that doesn't mean, you know, as long as you marry the right person and, and that he's just like, I will give that to you. Mm -hmm. And so my heart is for you to just to know that you know him. And I believe that's the root of this. And Besides, marriage isn't forever. Mm -hmm. Jesus made that clear. Is in heaven, there's not going to be a marriage. 
And uh, there is going to be a marriage to, to the lamb, um, to Jesus himself. But he says, it's, it's not going to be like this. And, and I, I know this is something that's deep in my heart. A lot of you guys know my testimony. That my, my mom actually died giving birth to me. And, uh, and then my dad remarried. But then my stepmother died in a car accident when I was about seven. And then my dad got married again. Then he died of cancer when I was 12. So, you know, you just go, I, I don't know. I did not expect to make it to 55. None of my, my parents or didn't even come close to that. And so I just go, wow, I, I'm still here. I'm going to use it for the Lord. And, um, but at the same time, I just go, at any moment, it, this is done. And, uh, and I stand before the God who created me, and I so badly want to, want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant, you know? Mm-hmm. And marriage is a part of that. Marriage is a huge part of that, how we interact with one another, but you got to understand the goal is to hear that and to stand before that God and go, well done. Your marriage had an impact it brought glory to me. You know, like when we talk about our friends losing their child and how much glory was brought to God. I believe God just looks at that situation and says, well done. And I want that for all of us. And so I'm going to um, I'm going to share I'm gonna a pray. message. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. Do it. Is that all right? Oh, yeah. Should I just? No, no. Stay here. Okay. Stay here. Yes. Eye candy. Um, <laughs> and you can uh, share more tomorrow morning. Great. But if you have something, interrupt me. Great. Okay. Because, okay. Uh, I just want to share a couple passages with you. Um, just to remind you of who we're talking about. Sometimes we get, get in church and, you know, that old hymn that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Like we just, we, we just prone to wander, right? You just feel it like, like you can know something at one moment and then just wander so far from that truth. And so I just want to remind you of who our God is. And some of this, now I'll share that later. Okay, but, but Hebrews chapter 12 I think we have it on the screen, right? Hebrews 12, verse uh, 18. Okay, he's, he's talking, and um, it's just a great description of God. You know, Hebrews kind of takes you back to the Old Testament, and everything about Hebrews is, is, man, God was intense. When you look at the way he was with Moses, but, but here's what pe- where people get mixed up, because when I grew up, I kind of thought, oh, that Old Testament God is so intense. And the New Testament is like, oh, he mellowed out, and it's all grace. And that is so far from the truth. God is a God of grace in the Old Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if anything, it's not, wow, he was so intense in the Old Testament. Oh, we can mellow out now. No, the book of Hebrews explains as amazing as that was, we're in a new time where it's even more intense. And I'm like, wow. And you read the book of Revelation, you go, yes, this ends pretty intensely. Um, But so here he's saying, for you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. Okay, when you pray... Remember before, just earlier, how we prayed? What did you picture in your mind? Anything? You know, sometimes we can come to prayer, and I, and I do this. I, I wander, and I'll just throw words up in the air and not think about who I'm addressing. Hebrews 12 is so good because he says, do you understand who you're coming before? You're not coming before what can be touched. Okay, we're not coming before like another human being I can just slap on the back. 
He says, but you're, you're coming before a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. A tempest is a storm like a tornado. Okay, he's quoting from Exodus 19. It seems like he takes the tempest from Job where it says God answered him out of the whirlwind. And, and, and Exodus 19 is when Moses is going up the mountain and, and, and the people are standing at the foot of the mountain going, oh my gosh, he's actually walking up to this mountain that is on fire fire and it talks about this darkness and gloom and and we don't normally use these words when we think about God okay but I I want us to understand this is who we're going to face at the end of our lives so you, you have not come to what may be touched a blazing fire a darkness a gloom a tempest the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. You see, the people back then, when they, it, when they saw all of that and they heard this trumpet, they're telling Moses, okay, we're not getting close to that mountain. We don't want to hear the voice of God anymore because we're surprised we're still alive after hearing that. You just go on our behalf. Okay, this is the same God we pray to right now. One of the most impactful moments in my life was when God gave me the clarity to think about who I'm praying to before I just start talking. And it's become a practice in my life that I wander from occasionally, but then I get right back, oh, wait a second, who am I talking to? Oh, yeah, and passages like this come to mind. Then the next verse. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Okay, so this is where he gets in the New Testament. He says, not only that, But in addition to that, you have this understanding that you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God. So so Moses was on Mount Sinai here. Now you've come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly, the Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. So picture more angels than you could even imagine up there celebrating. So, so when I pray, I'm coming for this God who's this blazing fire. It's not just someone you can touch. Just, you know, just this a voice like a trumpet and, and on and on and on. This tempest, this whirlwind. But then there's also just innumerable angels celebrating at his throne. And now I'm going to talk to him. And he goes on. And he says, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the the blood of Abel. So he says, uh, I, I think this stuff is really important to know, that when we sing, We're not starting a worship service. Like there's something going on in heaven. Okay? Something's going on right now. They're celebrating him. People that we know and love that have gone before us, it says they're there. This is is all happening simultaneous with us being in the room. And so sometimes we'll just join with them in heaven and the Bible says they, they're, they're like these witnesses and, and somehow there's knowledge of what's going on down here. And so we want to be one with all of this. And sometimes we can just get into our little problems. And some of that is because we don't look at the big picture of everything that's going on. Mm-hmm. And then it goes on. Um, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. 
You see that? It's not like, oh, that was scary back then. They're saying, no, they had that, you have that, and on top of that, you had Jesus warn you. So again, it's, it, Hebrews is about upping the intensity. And then he goes on, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's passages like that where I go, okay, do I care about your marriage? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I do, I do. Um, but really only as it pertains to that. Like we have a God who is a consuming fire. And, I, and he's genuinely here with us and watching this. Innumerable angels mm -hmm. in festal gathering. This God who is a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest. Who says, yeah, I shook the earth. Guess what? I'm going to shake the earth and the heavens. Like everything's going to change. And he says, we need to worship him in a way that's acceptable. Mm -hmm. With reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. That's who we stand before at the end of our lives. See, by the grace of God, I've understood what that God is like. And that's why divorce never enters my mind. It's never entered a conversation. It's just, it's, why? Because I'm going to stand before that God who, he says, I hate divorce. At the core, and this is a gift from God. Okay, people go, oh, you're one of those hellfire brimstone, those, those fear of God type of preachers. But God says in Isaiah, he says to Israel, he goes, the fear of the Lord is your treasure. I, man, that's my treasure. I'm so glad I fear God. man. The amount of trouble I'd be in and gotten in, the ways I would have ruined my life if I didn't have a fear of God at the foundation, if I didn't have that picture of what God is like and knowing who I'm going to answer to at the end of my life, I mean, I'm so great. That's the grace of God. Some of you may, may read that and, and maybe you were thinking about something else. You're still stuck on Mario Kart. You're, you're like, whatever, <laughs> you know, and because uh, your mind wanders and Others, by the grace of God, you'll read that and you'll go home and you'll read Hebrews 12 again and you'll go, oh man, I've forgotten what God is like, God. And it'll stick with you. And you just have this respect and this awe. And that's what makes you tremble. That's a gift. I go, God, I don't know why other people have read these passages and it did nothing to them. And yet I read it and it just hits at the core of who I am and I go, man, I know who I'm going to answer to. And I don't just flippantly say his name. I don't just flippantly pray to him and talk to him like I'm talking to just any one of my buddies. Understand who this God is that has to be at the foundation of your life. Mm -hmm. But here's the other thing. So by the grace of God, he's shown me that. But he's shown me something else recently. Something I have not noticed in 40 years of studying this book. And it's embarrassing to admit. Because it's so blatant, so obvious. But we all have baggage. And sometimes our baggage causes us to see certain things and not see certain things in scripture. You know what I mean? And, uh, and also the other thing is I prayed for this. This is a prayer that has been changing my life that I've been praying for the last two or three months. Here's my prayer has been. I'm saying, God, 
Please show me where I'm deceived. Because we'll look back at, like, remember when we used to fight about this? You know, 25 years, we'll laugh and go, that's so stupid. We all look back at life and we see things we did that we regret, they were stupid, and you're just like, why were we like that? And sometimes you really thought you were doing the right thing. And you, you just go, what was I thinking? But you were deceived. How many are deceived right now? Okay. The rest, <laughs> you're really deceived. <laughs> no, because here's the point, you guys. By very definition, you don't know. You, don't, you can't know. That's the thing. I'm not talking about temptation. We know when we're being tempted. We don't know when we're being deceived. And so we've all believed things that weren't true, and we, but we, didn't, we figured it out later. But I want to know now. Because the, the worst deception is I don't want to come to the end of my life and all those people like in Matthew 7, they go, Lord, Lord, but, but I thought I did these miracles in your name and I thought I did this. And he goes, depart from me, I never knew you. It's like a surprise. Wait, I thought I... There's, it's about deception. And so I've been praying, oh God, I know there's things that I believe about you that aren't true. Fix that in me. I know there are the ways that I'm doing certain things. There are things I'm sure I am not doing right, but I'm, I, I just don't know where those holes are. By your grace, would you reveal them to me? And I'm telling you, God is showing me. And it's not in this like, scolding like, oh, I'm so embarrassed of who I am, what an idiot I am, I just want to die. It's been like a very gracious like, thank you, this is so good because I hurt people when I'm deceived. And I lead them in the wrong direction. And the older we get, the more regrets you have in your life and the more you realize, yes, some things you can laugh about, but then some of your deception and some of your mistakes hurt people for a lifetime. And it's not funny, especially when it's your own children. And so I've just been praying, oh God, I wanna know. Show me where I'm deceived. Show me where I think I'm right and I'm not. And I'm begging you, pray that this weekend. Pray that tonight. God, show me where I'm deceived. Because the enemy is a deceiver. He's a liar, the Bible says. So it puts these lies in your head. And, and it's not like you just muster up your, by your own power. Yes, we read the word, but we also depend on the Holy Spirit to enlighten us. So here's a passage, Hebrews chapter 4. This has been so beautiful to me. Hebrews 4, verse 14. I think I gave it to you guys. There you go. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Go on. Next verse. 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Okay. When you think of Jesus, do you think of him being able to sympathize with your weaknesses? That was one area of deception in my life where I just think he doesn't. He's so powerful. Like, he can't understand my weaknesses. But that's not what Scripture says. And, and this is why we have Scripture. Because my natural mind would say he doesn't understand. He can't sympathize with my weaknesses. He's almighty God. He has no weakness. But then I have to trust the word of God. See, that, this is why we have to worry. Otherwise, you come up with a God who's like you. 
right? Well, I think he'd be like this. I think he'd be like this. And as a God of your imagination, that's why we need the scriptures. You go, wait, he sympathizes with my weaknesses? I have to believe that because it's the word of God. And I, this next one, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are? Wait, every respect? Do you know the temptations I've been through? You're telling me that Jesus was somehow tempted in, the, in every respect in the same way as I am. And that's my high priest. And again, this is not stuff I would naturally believe. The other stuff that I read earlier, I naturally get that. I just go, yeah, of course, he's God. He's a tornado, he's everything. He's all he, unapproachable light. I get it. He, I, and yet without sin. And then look at this next verse. This is the one that hit me. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. In 40 years of studying this book, I don't think I ever noticed that it was a throne of grace. I have preached many sermons about the throne of God. Some of you have heard me preach about the throne room of God. I don't know anyone that's preached more about the throne of God. Like I, you know, you, you, you talk about Isaiah 6, Revelation 4, 5, you know. I, I mean, I just, I'm infatuated with that throne. And if you asked me to describe the throne of God, I, I would go to Revelation. I'm like, man, he sits on this throne and he's lofty. He's exalted from Isaiah 6. The train of his robe fills the temple, but he dwells in unapproachable light. And there's lightning and thunder coming from the throne. There's pillars of fire around the throne. There's a sea of glass around the throne. There's, there's these four living creatures with eyes all over their body. They have six wings. They're, co they're covered with, I can tell you all these things. It's like, and that is his throne, and I come before that throne. And yet I never noticed Hebrews 4.16. That we draw near. Let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God has opened my eyes just in the last two weeks, just like I asked him to, and he has shown me that his throne is a throne of grace. Grace is when he just gives you something. He blesses you. You didn't earn it. He just gives you this undeserved favor. He just gives it to you. He says, you're going to find mercy. You're going to receive mercy. Mercy is when you should be punished, but he's not going to punish you. And God was opening my eyes because, look, yeah, I told him my dad died when I was 12. What I, I had a terrible relationship with him, though. We never had a conversation. He would beat me so bad for the tiniest things. I just remember, you, you know, when we open a door, we have to open it really slowly so it doesn't click and open it you know you know if there's any noise if we pull a door shut and it clicks he'd come out and just start beating me like things like that just remembering him just tying me to a tree and just going just different times when he just went after me and so that's why the, the Hebrews 12 passage Isaiah 6 I get that you want to talk about the holiness of God and the unapproachability of God and go, no, he dwells in unapproachable light. Are you kidding me? It's, it's like going to the sun. You don't go to the sun. You don't. And yet, this God says, let us then with confidence draw near, draw near to the throne of grace that our God is a God of grace. The throne is called a throne of grace. Just like when they 
built that Ark of the Covenant. It was the mercy seat that was on top of there. And, and when Moses, you know, heard from God, you know, and God's revealing himself, he says, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Like this is our God. And I just realized, you know, I never received mercy. I, I always got punished beyond what I deserved in my mind, you know? And so the thought of a throne of grace where it's his very nature that he just wants to give. And I don't know, sometimes when I prayed, I realized when I pray and I ask for things, I ask as though God doesn't really want to give them. You guys ever do that? Where you're, you know, I'll be on my knees like, God, please, can you please just get this marriage back together? Can you please like cause the church to get serious about you? Would you please have your spirit come into this room and, and change? I know you don't want to do this and I know you're busy with a bunch of other stuff and it's not in your nature to do. It's, it's like dumb. No, it's a God of grace, you know? And, 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 and it's, it's just like, I don't know, like we were on the way to our gathering the other Friday night and, and we passed this restaurant called House of Noodles. It's caught my eye. Um, <laughs> it's, it's almost like sometimes when I pray, it's like walking to the House of Noodles and I'm asking for a hamburger or something, you know? And it, it, of course, the owner's like, well, I don't know, I guess we could you know, squash some of this together, you know? But if it's a house of noodles and I walk in and go, hey, I want to buy 10 bowls of noodles. The guy's going, ah, oh, good night. You know, it's, a, you know, it's, this is what I, I can do that. I'm Chinese. Okay. You guys better not. Okay. So it's like, well, this is, this is what we do. Of course. Oh, I'm so thrilled in the same way. He says, no, would you approach my throne? Because my throne's a throne of grace. And you're going to come here and ask for grace as though it's called the throne of grace. And you can draw near to that and say, God, I need some grace in my life right now. He's like, finally, this is what I do. You know, it's I, I do, but you, you got to come. I'm Just push the button. Let me give you this grace. So this, is a, this has been such a powerful. Now, do I, did I know that God was a God of grace? Of course I did. I've studied. But you know, it's just one of those times where God just like, oh, I really get it. And I never thought of your throne as the throne of grace. I don't think I've ever called it the throne. How many times have I read this book and yet different verses will pay, you know, throne of grace, and I'll just keep reading. And sometimes I realize God was showing me that um, I, uh, I take too much control, like, I think, well, everyone's talking about grace, so I'm going to talk about holiness and wrath, and, you know, it's kind of like if I moved to Waco, I'm not going to open a barbecue place, because everything's barbecue. I'd open, like, the house of noodles, like a real, <laughs> give it a little variety here, you know? It's, it's that same thing. I, I, I think sometimes I just see everyone take advantage of God. Like he's this little nobody, like this little chihuahua, or, you know, just like talk to him like, like you're so disrespectful and I'm so tired of it that I, I maybe I've been afraid to talk about his grace. And that's wrong. I mean, heresy isn't just saying something that's absolutely wrong. Heresy can be just being so lopsided one way. 
that you neglect the totality of what God is like. And yet when you put it all together and you go, we've got this consuming fire and praise God for that. That's why the fear of the Lord is our treasure. If God was weak, I wouldn't feel safe under him. You know, I'm protected by God almighty. You know, not Jimmy. You know, it's just like <laughs> I have, you know what I mean? Like if it's just a, you know, an older man who's, you know, it, it's just like. <laughs> but it's the very fact. That's why, like we have to understand the holiness of God. And then we're like, wait, that God is for me? And then that God tells me that his throne is a throne of grace? And he tells me I can approach his throne and I'll receive mercy and he actually sympathizes with my weaknesses. And he's been tempted in every way, just as I've been. He says he gets me and I can come to his throne, that all-powerful, holy, unapproachable throne. I can draw near and ask him for grace. It's the only thing that makes sense. Otherwise, why the cross? If God was not a God of grace, don't you understand that? That's what the cross was all about. We know these verses. While we were yet sinners, we had nothing to offer him. We were a mess. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And God made him who knew no sin to be sin on behalf, on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God. This is all just, do you understand that there's this almighty God up there, but he's a God of grace. That's why despite all your rebellion and everything you've done, and he knows every secret, he knows your weaknesses. He knows the lies that are in this room. He knows the thoughts that have gone through your minds. He knows it all. And that's why Jesus died on the cross. He was paying for that. He paid for that. Why? Because God is a God of mercy and grace. He's like, they deserve it. And I have all power to execute my wrath. And they are by nature objects of wrath. But I'm going to show the greatest act of grace. Because I want you to know what my throne is like. That you can come and find mercy. You'll receive mercy and you'll find grace in your time of need. That's why... We wanted to start tonight in prayer and with the right picture of God because we all can kind of lean one way or another. And some of it is the way we were brought up. That's why I try so hard. I go, God, I'm trying to be that perfect dad. I'm trying to be strong like you are so that my kids understand like you are the authority. And so I am the authority in my home. And yet you are this God that is so approachable and wants relationship. And so I have deep relationships with my kids. And I'm trying to be both, but I'm going to fail. At times we're going to be on both sides. And our parents failed. And, and, and it warps our view of God. That's why I'm like, gosh, this is a heavy thing to, to be a good father because I'm going to affect my kids. I want to hang out and enjoy them and love them and be with them because that's the way God is. And yet I need to be the authority and, and hold the line because that's the way God is. And somehow our greatest authority is also our, our most intimate relationship. And, and those never go together. But God, I want to be that because that's who you are. And so somehow to be that type of man in the home we need the grace of God and say, God, okay, I need to become that, Lord. And only you can do that in me. And so that's the great promise is the Holy Spirit that he puts in us and enables us. 
even, even though I didn't really understand that throne of grace that well, um, even though this is a new revelation to me, for some reason God had grace on my life, um, even though I was raised the way that I was, I think that was one of the biggest surprises, Lisa said, it's really weird seeing you with our kids. Like you immediately just loved them and you never tasted of that. And yet they're crazy about you. You're crazy about them. That's a grace of God. I don't, I don't, I didn't even read Throne of Grace till a couple weeks ago. You know, like I, <laughs> that's what I mean. It's like God just gives you things. It's like the bullet. It's just like, I'm a great dad. You know, like, it, it's just, how did that happen? It's just his grace. But we got to come and we've got to believe. You got to believe that he's an almighty God and he's a God of grace. And you pray to him and you'll find grace. So I already went over our time, but I don't know. I still got 50 seconds. Um, Lisa's going to preach to you tomorrow. Um, I, can you pray sure. for everyone? Because um, I know we're going to have some discussion time and this and that. And, mm. But I just want to believe in this prayer. God, have mercy on us. We need your grace to understand who you are, what you have accomplished, what you are doing. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would lead and direct conversation between husbands and wives so that our marriages can glorify you, God. So we can bring you the glory that you deserve. Would you pour out wisdom that we do not have on our own, Lord? We recognize our weakness. Mm. We come with all of our baggage and lay it before you and say, please, Lord, mm. take this and bring beauty from ashes. That's what you do. So I just pray for Holy Spirit-directed conversation now. And I pray for a spirit of humility, Lord, mm. because pride is our greatest enemy. Mm. And you oppose the proud. You stand against us when we're so proud. Mm. So please give us a spirit of humility. By your grace, Lord, we need humility. We want to be humble because you give grace to the humble. We trust you, Lord. Thank you that your word is a light. It's a light, Lord. It's so precious to us. Help us to love your word, to delight in your commands to desire your truth above every, oh, all the quotes and just all the incessant talking of all of us fools, Lord. Mm -hmm. We want the truth of your word. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. Give us a fresh love for your word, Lord, that we would literally just have a hunger for it. We would want to devour it like an amazing meal that would satisfy our hearts. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name.